social worker in the geriatric medicine department here at Kaiser. We teach these classes on a monthly basis in partnership with Redwood Caregiver Resource Center. This class is actually class four of the It Takes Two series that the California Caregiver Resource Centers um, <clears throat> teach across the state. And I've been teaching this class since about 2002. This is the fourth class in that series, the fourth and last class in that series. The, the first three classes are the ones we've already taught. Um, understanding dementia um, and the grief and loss associated with having to make changes when we're adapting to our loved one's new needs. Communication strategies in the context of this new dementia diagnosis. Last month was kind of taking those communication strategies and applying them to challenging behaviors like anger, irritability, hallucinations, delusions. And this class kind of requires us to use all of those strategies to apply to personal care, um, which I think can be one of the most challenging situations um, of care. We are both parties are kind of rendered pretty vulnerable. It's, it can be uncomfortable to be providing personal care to a loved one, and it can be uncomfortable to receive that kind of care. So that intersection is really delicate. It requires a lot of skills on our part and a lot of remembering to keep things in the context of our loved one's neurocognitive impairment, which is <clears throat> not a reminder we always want. So, Quickly, let's just review some key points. Um, that's all right, there's some seats in the back over here. Quickly, let's just review some key points. Last month, we talked about behavior as always being the attempt to fill an unmet need. And so let's just review together what those <coughs> basic human needs are. And if you say something and I don't write it down, it's not because I don't think it's a good thing. I just am trying to help us distill those needs down to their really basic form. I'm thinking maybe five or six things. Does anybody who, anybody who is here, do you remember? Nutrition. So you said nutrition, housing, I think food, water, clothing, shelter. Nutrition the, is under. Yeah, the physical needs. I would put that under physical needs, definitely. If those things aren't met, nothing else matters, right? What else? Safety, Safety security, absolutely. So activity, what need does that fill? Uh, uh, hold on just a sec. Thank you. So, so if we're helping someone stay stimulated, what does that mean? Help the brain. But the basic need, I think, it, that, that we care. I think the basic need that that fills is a sense of value and worth. If the person is worth the effort it takes for us to facilitate those activities, the basic understanding is this person I'm with cares about me. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Those are very important needs to be filled, and they fill an even more basic need. Yeah, because it engages them. Mm -hmm. engages them and, you know. So a sense of, thank you. And the other thing that I'm picking up on there that's also a very basic human need is the need for purpose. We don't just want activity that keeps us occupied. We want purposeful, meaningful activity. We need to have a sense of purpose. <clears throat> There's a reason for us to be around, right? What else? Human interaction. So I think human interaction comes here. <coughs> Ab 
absolutely. If people are interacting with me, they value me. My sense of value and worth and belonging are, are filled through that interaction. What else? A sense of power and control, personal power and control. I've got some say in my life. I've got some autonomy. Notice I said a sense of, because as someone's neurocognitive impairment progresses, we might not be able to let them be in control of a whole heck of a lot of things. It might not be safe. It might not be practical or possible, but we can help to create a sense. And we talked about that in the previous classes, how simply not arguing with a made up story can give someone a sense of control over the content of the interaction. Does that make sense? I can't give them control over the keys to the car or control over the stove or as we're talking today, even control over when and how they bathe. But we might be able to give a sense of power and control with basic choices, now or later, blue or yellow, yes or no. But a very, very basic and powerful way to convey a sense of power and control is not to disagree with a made-up story, not to contradict someone. Telling a story puts a person in a powerful position. I have information and I've got something to pass along to you. I have something meaningful and if I'm telling a story and I'm in control of the content, I also feel a sense of purpose and value. I've got something to give. A lot of these are interwoven. And then another one that I think is very important is a sense of familiarity and predictability. Now, the world has been unpredictable since the day we were born. We know how to live with unpredictability. I'm not talking about the need to tell the future. I'm talking about some containment, some sense of preparedness for what may be coming at me. We take for granted how much mental mapping we do just to carry out mundane tasks and how much we rely upon our memory to do that. Going to the ladies' room is not a terrifying, a terrifying prospect for me because I know what I might encounter. I know what the hallway is going to look like. I know there are doors that might open and close. I know when I hear those voices or people walk past me, that's expected. When I walk in, there may or may not be people in there, but if there are, the sounds are probably going to echo around. The light's going to bounce off of everything. There might be toilets flushing. There might be water running. Those things aren't going to be alarming to me because I can predict that it might happen. So lack of familiarity and predictability can cause us to feel very scared. In fact, they use disorientation to torture people. So these basic needs are really important, and they're also really threatened by the dementia process. A person's ability to meet their physical needs without help is impaired. To have that sense of safety and security requires memory of the indicators that I am safe and secure. And understanding and recognition of what those indicators are. A sense of value and worth, it's hard to feel valuable and, and worthy if you don't have that reinforcement, if people are correcting me all the time, if I don't have purposeful activity, especially in a culture that tells us that our worth is determined by our contribution. Personal power and control, we're losing a lot of that. And that sense of familiarity and predictability, I just went over that. So as we're looking at challenges with resistance to help with personal care, we kind of want to be mindful of this.
because behavior is always the attempt to fill an unmet need. That was the topic of last month's class. So we need to keep this in mind when we're managing difficult behaviors related to personal care. Generally, when we see resistance to help with personal care, there are psychological, social, and physical reasons why a person might be resistant to having help with personal care. There's some seats back here. I like to kind of lump the psychological and social together into psychosocial reasons, and then we'll do physical reasons. But what I'd like to do together as a group is brainstorm what those reasons might be. So psychological reasons, what are beliefs and thoughts about bathing and needing help with bathing? Social might be, what, is, what are the cultural expectations? What's been my experience? And then we'll do physical together afterwards. So together, let's just take bathing as the example. We can apply this to any area of resistance, but let's just take bathing together so it's a chewable bite. What are some psychological or social reasons why a person with a dementia might be resistant to having help with bathing or resistant to bathing? Yes? Invasion of privacy. It feels like an invasion of privacy, absolutely. What else? Loss of control. Loss of control. A power issue. Can you elaborate on that? He feels he can do it himself. Mm. He didn't. Uh -huh. So there's a power issue who's in control of when and how, right? I don't need help. But I also hear there's some confusion. That would be a psychological reason, right? A belief that. I don't need help. So a couple of things come up. There's the understanding that someone's helping me and I feel invaded. And then there's the lack of awareness for my need for help, which makes me feel offended. I don't need help. Why are you suggesting I need help? That's crazy. And then I get my guard up. So this is poor insight around need. That can be an issue. There can also be shame around need if, I'm, if I have a little more insight. A lot of this is fluid. A lot of it is both and. What else? Since I wrote shame, what are the many permutations of shame that might come up around an adult needing help with bathing? Embarrassment. Embarrassment. Why? Because you can't see your body. Okay. Embarrassment having to be told, you know, also. Uh huh. So modesty. Uh -huh. So that's kind of up here, yeah. right? That's kind of offended. But I think if you're aware that you need help and someone's telling you, there might be some shame around needing the reminder, right? Shame around feeling dependent. If I'm aware of my dependence, right? Needing help with personal care is really the height of dependence.
you know, we expect that if a person has a cognitive impairment, after a while, they're not going to be able to operate the power tools or drive the car or balance the checkbook or work at the nuclear power plant. But when they can't bathe themselves, when they can't clean themselves after using the toilet, when they can't brush their own teeth, that's really the height of dependence. I mentioned earlier, it kind of renders both parties really vulnerable. So if I'm aware of this level of dependence, I might have some shame around it. Even if I'm not aware of it, I might feel offended or invaded. Resentment. Tell me about that. The person needs you to do it, and they resent that. Around being dependent? Mm hmm I think that makes sense, and I think also maybe some resentment at the suggestion, right? So if they don't have the insight, they might be resentful of you for suggesting it. If they do have some insight, they might be resentful of their own needs. Somebody going to say something? Also, well, isn't it true with dementia patients they tend to lose their sense of smell? Sometimes. And they don't know they stink? Right. <laughs> so they don't have awareness, right? <clears throat> Um, poor awareness. Again, there's the need up here where I say poor insight around need for help. But what I'm hearing you say is poor awareness around the need for the bath to begin with, exactly. right? right? They remember, I mean, what I get is I did it already. Yeah. Well, they remember they used to bathe every day, so that must have been what they did. Yeah, that's what I was Right. So a belief they don't have help, but there's also that belief I already did. Right? They're not tracking time the same way we are. They have bathed before. <laughs> and they're not, they don't know that their last shower they took was two weeks ago. I already did. This is a function of that poor memory and time tracking. Can feel like stubbornness and, you know, uncooperation, but more, more likely a function of poor memory and insight. I don't smell, I heard. I want to kind of spend some time on this one because how many of you, and no judging here, how many of you have used you need to take a bath, you're starting to smell as an attempt to try to get someone to get into the bath or the shower? Yeah, it makes sense, right? That's when we need to bathe. You're getting kind of stinky. Has it ever worked? Sometimes it does. Sometimes it does. Yeah. Yeah. Also, a little trick you can try to fill out of your box, right? So I'm from the school of whatever works. If it works, yeah. do it. If it doesn't work, scrap it. Yeah. For it those, only it might only work once. For right. for those of you who tried it and it didn't work, my guess is it made matters worse. Oftentimes, people get really offended, and you know we're talking a lot about the psychological piece. We haven't talked a lot about the cultural piece. What does our culture say about smelly, dirty people? Coleman. And what about that? Yeah. Again, there's more shame here, right? Shame around being dirty. You dirty, rotten scoundrel. You dirty rat. Dirty, dirty, dirty. There's such negative connotations around being dirty. And if we remember back to a few months ago when we talked about people with dementia kind of holding on to those longer term memories and beliefs, then we'll remember that people will probably be more in those kind of childhood foundational places. And on the playground, the dirty, smelly kid got ostracized, depending on what 
when this person grew up, especially if this is a person who grew up around the time of the depression, there was a lot of shame around being poor and dirty and we couldn't bathe all the time and shame and grief around that. So sometimes in our attempt to help, you know, stimulate some awareness of the need, when it backfires, it might be because it's tapping into that shame around what dirty means. To be a dirty girl, a dirty rat, a dirty scoundrel, right? You dirty dog. There's so much wrapped into that concept and that symbol of dirtiness. Remember that communication and language for people with dementia is often very symbolic. The feeling and the connotation around the word is more uh, accessible to them than the actual definition. Does that make sense? What else? Uh-huh. Right. I don't need a child of mine telling me what to do in doing this. So there are some role issues. What about fear? I find that's a big one. Fear or anger. So let's do fear first and then remind me about anger. What fear of falling? How can, how can fear manifest? Falling, what else? Paranoia. How? Are you in the shower, you shouldn't kind of kill them. Uh-huh. So they don't feel safe? Yeah. Fear around threat to safety. Now remember those long-term memories, right? I've got a five-year-old at home. I'm teaching him about, we, we talk about the bathing suit areas, right? We teach our kids when they're this big. We keep our privates private. We don't let people take our clothes off except mommy and daddy if they're helping you and the doctor or the nurse, right? We're taught modesty. We're taught not to be alone in a room with someone who's trying to take off your clothes. So I'm confused. I don't have awareness or insight for my need and there's this person kind of manhandling me, corralling me into this small space, trying to take off my clothes and shove me into a chamber. It can be really scary. So threat to safety, I think there's a fear of violation. And we don't know what may have happened to people in their earlier lives, even if there are family members. I don't know every single detail. I mean, my parents have some things that are private, I would imagine. But even if something traumatic hadn't happened, this can feel traumatic now and tap into that fear that I might be getting accosted. <coughs> Bless you. So somebody said anger. So I'm glad that those were brought up together because I think anger is always that instinctive response to vulnerability. Anger keeps us instantly powerful when we feel powerless. Anger gets us through the day if we feel threatened. So what might the anger be about? What are some of the things you hear when your loved ones go home? Go home. Right, so anger around feeling in, invaded, right? That's that invasive piece. And I, I heard from you too, you said you're, you're providing care for a parent. So maybe some anger around feeling disrespected. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, your parent might not recognize a whole heck of a lot of the depth and breadth and scope of the issue, but they know this is a child of mine, and no child of mine is going to tell me what to do, and no child of mine is taking my clothes off 
and manhandling me in my own home, thank you very much, right? Go home. Can feel very disrespected. And even if it's not a parent child, you know, the way the person interprets our approach can, can um, cause them to feel disrespected. And the way we deliver our approach can feel disrespectful. And my guess is nobody in this room intends to be disrespectful. You wouldn't be here right now. But sometimes inadvertently, our approach can come across that way to someone who's confused. Out of our own frustration. Out of our own frustration and out of our sense that we're responsible to get this task done, mm -hmm. right? There's so much burden of responsibility, too. Where's that line? What does enough look like? Yeah. Anything else here that's glaringly omitted that you think we should add? I mean, we could go on all day, but I'm trying to watch the clock. If anyone can think of anything that should go on here or think about your own situation, something that's come up that we haven't talked about, let me know. Otherwise, we'll transition to physical. It's really an uncomfortable intersection. And if you have dementia, you might not be aware of what's happening. Just because we walk down the hall to the bathroom doesn't mean I'm, and you told me it's time to take a shower, doesn't mean I remember that by the time you start undressing me. So you guys weren't prepared for what I was going to tell you to do. You felt caught off guard. And you knew you, you could stop it from happening. And it still felt uncomfortable and unexpected. So I love to do that exercise because I think it just kind of gives us a sense of how awkward and uncomfortable that can feel every time. Even though we know what's happening, even though they've taken many showers, even though we're familiar, doesn't mean in that moment this feels familiar. Doesn't mean in that moment this was predictable, that I feel like I have a sense of power and control. All of those needs are kind of feeling threatened in that moment. So let's kind of close our eyes or just kind of consider the bathroom that we have in our home or our loved one's place of residence if they're not at home, the place where our loved one bathes or needs to bathe. Um, just kind of bring yourself there. Bring all of your five senses there. Now, at my house, the bathroom is not the most accessible room in the house. It's not the largest room in the house. It's not the room that's most easily maneuvered. So now that we kind of are thinking about that place, let's think about some physical reasons why a person with dementia might be resistant to help with bathing. Confined. It's confined, yeah. Difficult to maneuver. Just the confinement can be scary, right? I can't escape. I might be violated. I might, you know, they're going to try to kill me. Sometimes I hear people say that. They're trying to kill me. So difficult to maneuver and also <coughs> difficult to escape. Kind of feel trapped in there. What else? So stepping into the shower yeah, or into the bath, falling, stepping over the tub, yeah. yeah. So surfaces, I love this part. The surfaces are, somebody said slippery, but think about, cold. yeah, they're cold. But they're really spongy and soft, so if we fall on them, we'll bounce. <laughs> yeah. Most of the surfaces in a bathroom are really hard and sharp, right? Yeah. So they're hard. They can be sharp. Yeah, reflective. reflective. That's a big one, and most people don't think of that one. It's huge. It's just your bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> it's reflective. It's reflective surfaces covered in chrome. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. In fact, one of the things I recommend is putting little hooks on the side of the mirror. The mirror is another big one. But, you know, if you close your eyes again and put yourself in your bathroom and you turn on the light, phew, the light reflects off of everything. This is a big one. And we don't often think of that. I'm glad you did. Also the physical, whether you say, well, my mom, my back hurt. You know, yes. She's so over pain. So I'll help you. No, I don't need help. Right. I mean, it's pain. Pain. And it's painful, and they might not make the logical conclusion that because I'm in pain and at risk of falling, I therefore need help, because that's a lot of logic and reasoning. So a person could have pain. A person could be unsteady on their feet. A person might not be ambulatory. What if someone's in a wheelchair? using all that durable medical equipment. I'm going to call it DME, durable medical equipment, which just makes a confined space more confined, right? So takes up space. And can be challenging to use and confusing. Uh huh. I'm gonna put this. Uh huh. Right. So locating supplies. I put confusion over here. Is there a lock closet? So let's talk about the water. What about the water? Water temperature. So water temperature. Good, so room temperature. Yeah. Bathrooms tend to be drafty. They tend to be cold, not just the surfaces. I, I will, but let's go back to water. The water temperature, also water pressure is huge. Yeah. You gotta, you know, so I would put that under the durable medical you know, equipment, right? That it's really confusing. Yeah. yeah, and it yeah. looks yeah. odd, and there's all this stuff everywhere. Would noise come in on that? Absolutely. And I didn't forget about the mirror. It's my favorite one. <laughs> noise. So what about the noise? How does yeah. how do you know someone's in the bathroom if you're on the phone with them? Hear the water running. You could hear the water running. Flushing. Flushing. Even before that, running. it echoes, right? So the sound can be amplified in the bathroom. And it's also distorted, right? Which is, if I'm already confused to have distorted, amplified sound and all this reflection and all of this, it gets to be really, really overwhelming. OK. <coughs> The mirror can be very confusing. I've walked into bathrooms with people with dementia, and they wave at those people over there. <laughs> oh, look, they're in here too. It's us. They don't know it's their reflection. One time, I was years and years ago, back in the 90s, I used to work at an Alzheimer's Day program. And there was a gentleman, every time I'd take him to the bathroom, He'd be at the sink washing his hands, and he'd look up into the mirror, and he thought his grandfather was there. And he would try to shake his grandpa's hand. And luckily, he was really, he wasn't threatened by it. And he was in good spirits most of the time. So he would just think grandpa was doing like some Three Stooges kind of joke with him. And he'd go, oh, Gramps. You know, he would laugh. But he really thought that was his grandfather there. So if I'm in this bathroom feeling really overwhelmed, I might be fearful that I'm being violated, and there are people watching us, 
or they're violating those people too, that lady's over there crying while someone's doing this to them, that can be really alarming. So covering up the mirror can be really helpful. So we could probably add to this too if we had more time. But I think just looking at this, the picture we get is that there are a lot of really valid reasons why a person with dementia would have some resistance to help with bathing or bathing at all. All of these we agree are possible and, and true, correct? So it's really less likely that someone's just resistant because they're lazy or resistant because they're, you know, um, stubborn. There are some really valid reasons. And so the videos we're going to watch today are actually um, filmed as instructional videos for people who work in long-term care facilities. Don't let that put you off. The concepts and the strategies can be applied at home. Some of the things that they talk about, you know, they talk about CNAs or they talk about, um, you know, schedules or residents. Please just take that with a grain of salt. What we're really looking at is the spirit of being adaptive, the spirit of being flexible, the spirit of finding a way to minimize some of these scary, confusing, confining, and really unsafe for both parties in that confined, slippery space. And to try to maximize this sense of these basic needs being met and cared about and filled. So we're going to pivot our chairs. The first clip we're going to watch, well, it's actually more than a clip, is called Bathing Without a Battle. And this talks about some adaptive strategies to bathing. I'll get the lights. Thank you. great ideas about bathing with you. Any direct caregiver that has bathed people with dementia knows that it can be a very distressing experience for you and the resident, and sometimes it is dangerous. During such a bath or shower, the person will sometimes hit, struggle with the caregiver, or even bite. At other times, the person may yell, Sometimes they'll refuse to go near the bath or shower. I think we'll get into this. And at other times, the person will allow himself to be bathed, but clearly is miserable. <laughs> Surveys show that as much as half of nursing home residents get distressed during bathing. Wouldn't it be nice if there were some simple, practical ways to make that different? Well, I'm here to tell you that there are. We're going to share them on this video. Now, what you might be thinking right now, if you're a CNA, is, wait a minute. What new is there to tell me about bathing? I've been doing it for years. Or you could be asking, a nurse teaching me about bathing? They don't even do it. But don't fall asleep and don't tune this out. Because the things we're going to share with you come from direct caregivers just like you. Most caregivers know a lot about bathing and have a lot of experience. Over the last 10 years, we've gathered together a lot of that information and added some new ones that we discovered. The interventions that we're going to share with you are good for the resident, but just as important, they're also good for you. They can make your work easier and more enjoyable. We call this making bathing person-centered rather than task-centered. Let's start with you. What if you were to get a shower in your nursing home? How would you feel about that? Would you want to do it? Why not? You don't want to 
want to roll down the hall in that lovely shower chair? Well, when I ask people how they feel about that, they say things like, well, it would be embarrassing. I don't want anybody to see me naked. It's cold. It's painful and uncomfortable. It's not private. Or they'll say, I just had a shower this morning. I don't need to. <coughs> That's exactly what our nursing home residents tell us when they're being invited to take a shower. Think about your last pleasant bath or shower in your own home. How is it different? How would it compare to the experience of the person that you bathe? <coughs> it's not the same at all, is it? Bathing should be pleasant or at least tolerable for residents, just as it is for us. In this program, we'll be showing you a number of real-life situations. We've blurred the features of the residents and the staff to preserve privacy and dignity and obtained written consent for the use of these videos for educational purposes. Let's take a look at an actual case. In this video, the person doesn't want to be bathed, but the caregiver insists. I don't want no showers alone. I like them. No, no. Well, we're not going to take that long to have to give you a shower. No, you don't have to. But they don't like you. Don't have to well, give you the person goes along, but as the shower proceeds, she gets more and more upset. Amen. 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 are doing the best job they can in a difficult situation when suddenly the situation turns more violent. The caregiver that was not bitten struggles to finish the shower. Watch what happens next. Experiences like this are exhausting and dangerous for all involved. And the caregiver was just trying to do her job. This is the kind of situation that we're working to change. The nursing assistants in this clip were not doing a bad job. They did not have the tools, the instruction, and the permission to do it in a different way. And it's that way all over. Currently, many people think that this type of forced bathing is required or necessary to keep people clean and healthy. Yet, there's no solid evidence to support this practice. And now we've learned that forced bathing does not have to happen. There are ways to keep people clean without a battle. And they involve putting the person before the task of bathing, getting to know the person, better communication, and flexibility in when, where, how, and how often people are bathed, and having a variety of techniques that you can use to provide a pleasant experience. Here is the same resident being showered after one of the CNAs we just saw had adapted her approach to meet this person's special needs. Watch for what's different. We won't give you a bath, we'll give you just a wash up. Yeah, that'll be all right with me. Okay. Do the same thing. I'm going to put this over here so it can be warm in the hallway. So we get up and clean you up. All right. Come on. Just get home and finish the crib. Yeah. Can you identify what was different about that shower? Here are a few of the things that the aide now does. She reassures the person that she'll be covered and warm, and she does it. She talks with her about things that she knows the person is interested in, such as her church. She gives her a sense of control by asking if she can remove her gown. And also notice that this shower only required one aide to do it. If the person had resisted having her gown removed, the aide could have left it on and rinsed around it or used a no-rinse soap. Now let's look at another technique we used with the same resident, this time bathing her in bed using a large towel moistened with a no-rinse soap product 
sort of like covering her with a giant washcloth. And again, keeping her covered and warm and in control. We call this a towel bath. And later, we'll show you exactly how to do it. But for now, let's look at how it went. And remember, this is the same person that we saw previously. Can I wash your face? Yes, ma'am. I'll take your glasses. It's going to burn it all. Yes, ma'am. You know you got the cream to keep it. she went from cursing, grabbing, and biting to thanking the CNA and offering to pay for the service? How much better both must feel. The person is dignified and has a good experience, and the aide does her job without feeling endangered. But how do we go from here to there? The first step to making bathing better is to understand what goes wrong. Often it's because people being bathed <coughs> feel bad during the experience. They're embarrassed, or cold, painful things happen, they become afraid, or they feel a complete loss of control. How staff communicate with residents before and during the bathing process is really important. You saw in an earlier video clip that when the aide used the word bath, the resident said she didn't want a bath. And then the CNA skillfully said, well, we won't give you a bath, we'll give you a wash up. And then that was fine with the resident. Other important communication points include let them know what you're going to do before you do it, because saying nothing is not helpful. And then sincerely apologize if they complain. Talk with them. Get a conversation going. Know the likes and dislikes of the person and use them to facilitate care. It's a matter of your being able to tailor the way you wash people to meet their special needs and wishes. The first thing that CNAs and nurses ask me when I tell them about this is how much longer will all this take? Well, we've researched this and found that individualized bathing does not take significantly more time. But let's listen to what one CNA, Beth Parker, who implemented these approaches, had to say. Actually, for the most part, it can actually take less time. Uh, the resident is more comfortable. Um, they're not as resistive, and we're able to provide hygiene usually much more efficiently. Another important question you might be asking is, what will the surveyor say? Well, you know, there are no regulations that dictate that someone has to get into a shower or tub. It just says that we're responsible to meet their hygiene needs. There's also nothing in the regulations about the number of times per week that a person is to get a shower or tub bath. In fact, this material was presented to surveyors on a teleconference with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, an organization which oversees all surveyors. Regulations do specify that all care needs to be adapted for individual needs, and surveyors are now beginning to issue citations when they see that this doesn't happen in bathing situations. Now let's look in detail at what you can do. It's important to think of the shower not as a task to be done, but as an activity occurring as part of a relationship. So when someone resists or gets upset, try to understand the meaning of that behavior. Address issues of cold, pain, need to feel in control. Work to make it a pleasurable activity for you both, so it's a win-win situation. Let's look at a typical shower. shower starts at the top and works down with the person uncovered and cold throughout the process. However, 
Having water on the face and the head is one of the most distressing parts of the shower for people with dementia. Plus, the person is usually sitting on a very cold and uncomfortable shower chair. So how can we make it more pleasant? Well, first of all, we can make the shower chair more comfortable. Let me show you how. One of the things that goes wrong in the shower is the shower chair itself. It's pretty uncomfortable. It doesn't have any padding in the seat space. So let me have someone come in and sit on it and just give us their opinion on it. This is Anne Louise Barrett, and she's going to tell us what this chair feels like to her. It's really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It's hurting my back. Your back? And I think my seat is going to fall through. It's the weirdest feeling. You're kind of like falling through the hole. Uh -huh. That's mm -hmm. what it really feels like. And um, my feet are dangling, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just kind of hanging there. Yeah. I wouldn't want to take a shower in this chair. Does it feel like you're kind of falling out? It feels like I'm falling out. Yeah, I'm moving forward. Yeah. OK, well, you know what? I think we can fix this. All right. One of the first things you wanted to do is look at padding the seat, and there's a number of ways to do that. One way would be to take some washcloths and drape them over the seat, or you can do it with a towel and wrap the towel around. You just place that towel in the place that was most important for where the person might be experiencing the pain. Or the last thing that you can do for padding the seat is to take something like this, which is just a simple child's potty seat insert that's padded, and just put it into the hole in the chair, like that. You can also pad the back of the chair. Here I have some uh, pipe insulation. It's a closed cell phone, and you just slide it over the back like this. You could put it on the arms also. But because this chair also has this difficult um, nylon that's rough on the skin, you might want to take a towel and just put it over the back. I'm sure many of you already do that. But the one last thing we had to deal with is that she was complaining that her feet weren't dangling. And one of the things you can do is to take a very simple basin that you have in, around in the care facility, turn it over, and use it as a footstool. So now let's invite Anne Louise to come back and try it with these modifications. How's that? Oh, that's a lot better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Feels more comfortable. Uh, I still don't want to shower. I've <laughs> <laughs> got some alternatives. <laughs> Next, it's a very simple and humane thing to do to cover the person with towels during the shower. You can also use conversation or things to hold for distraction, and this can be valuable. Say what you're going to do and thank the person when things go well. If the shower spray is uncomfortable, Consider using a washcloth or perhaps a no rinse soap. Here's the same woman being showered using some of these principles. All right, so I'm going to be the other side, okay? I'm going to be this side. Did you come, okay? Yes, Miss Ford. Yes, ma'am. see this person is now enjoying or at least tolerating the shower she's covered and warm the caregivers talking with her telling her what she's going to do and the pace is slow and gentle here's another example of a shower that uses some of the same principles to create a pleasant experience <laughs> Residents are frightened by the tubs in long-term care facilities. 
They find the tubs with lifts unfamiliar and frightened. One person, being lowered into her tub, asked why someone was putting her in a hog boiling tank. What else gives people a negative impression? To begin with, look around. What does your tub room look like? Does it look like this when you walk in? Here are some simple things that we did to make it more inviting. Here's another tub room before we remodeled it. And here's what it looked like after it was remodeled. Notice how it looks much more familiar and friendly, even though there's an unfamiliar tub in the room. As with showering, if you change your approach to tub bathing to improve comfort, privacy, and a sense of connection, it'll make a big difference. Keep the person covered and warm. Reassure them. Move slowly. Consider using a no-rinse soap in the tub if you need to make the process quicker and simpler. If the person remains fearful and resistive, try a different method. Here's the same woman you saw fighting and struggling in the lift, being much more cooperative when she's given a shower and encouraged to help herself. no matter how you try to adapt the shower or tub, will still be uncomfortable. For them, bathing in the room is a good option to explore. Bathing in the bed works well for people who are hard to move because of sickness, pain on movement, or obesity. Bed bathing is also helpful for people who get upset or afraid of the shower or the tub. And some people just prefer this method of bathing. I'm sure that you already know how to do a typical bed bath using basins of water. What we would like to share with you is a pleasant alternative that's quick and keeps people warm and covered throughout. It's called a towel bath, and it's simple, practical, and easy once you get used to it. The next few clips show CNAs getting the person ready, setting up the equipment, and completing the towel bath. Awake yet? Okay. I'm gonna cover you up while I get your your towel nice and warm for you. Okay. I'll be back in just a few moments. Notice how the nursing assistant loosened the clothes and got the person ready to be washed, and then assured that she was warm before she left to get her equipment. Next, we'll see how to set up the equipment. The equipment that you need to do the towel bath is pretty basic and easy to obtain. You're going to need a graduate, one that will fit underneath the faucets on your sink, a no-rinse soap, a small medication cup to measure the no-rinse soap, a plastic bag. Into the bottom of that plastic bag, you're going to want to place a couple of washcloths, perhaps a hand towel, and then you're going to have your bath sheet that has been fan folded like an accordion fold and place that on top all right and you're going to turn on the water you want it warm um, 100 to 110 degrees so it feels warm on your wrist you want to fill your graduate. We found that it takes um, a liter to two liters, maybe a little bit more to get everything universally moist. You don't want it, it's, it's as though you had taken a washcloth and gotten it wet and wrung it out really good. And you're going to use an ounce of the no-rinse soap and put just part of it in the graduate after you put in the water. If you put it in before, you're going to have a lot of sud. And then starting down at the bottom of your where your washcloths and towel are, just start pouring the water over it. You just want to get a uniform amount of water over all of it so it's damp. After you've massaged it thoroughly for a little bit, you want to feel inside just to make sure that everything is uniformly damp, and then you can close the top 
and take it to the resident ready for the towel bath. Now you're ready to give the towel bath. Let's watch how one CNA does it. First, the caregiver explains what he's going to do. Next, he gently and gradually works the large, warm, moist towel underneath the dry blanket so the person stays covered all the time. Next, the caregiver starts washing the part of the body that is least distressing. In this case, it's the feet. Can I settle with your feet? He continues washing the body by massaging gently through the towel. Think of the towel as a giant washcloth. he uses one of the washcloths from the bag to clean the peri area. I want to clean between your legs now, okay? Just don't In the next clip, the caregiver turns the person on one side and places a smaller warm towel from the plastic bag on the back, washing in a similar manner. Then he uses a washcloth from the plastic bag to wash the buttocks and the rectum. Oh, you pampered me. Yeah. I'm doing good, too. doing great. I ain't got no money left now. Mm -hmm. Finally, he removes the wet towel, making sure the person remains warm and covered. No rinsing or drying is required. Better put something dry, not a blanket. A dry blanket on me. He's done. At this time, you can let the person rest comfortably for a brief time, or you can get them dressed. If you raise the bed, be sure to lower it back down to the best height for the resident before you leave the room. Keep in mind that this person had been very difficult and resisted in the shower. However, what we see is a woman who feels warm, in control, and respected throughout the process. And she thanks him numerous times for helping her. Here are a few additional tips on the towel bath technique. To wash under the legs, have the person bend their knee. This gives you access to the underside of the leg and the inner thigh. And remember that like the shower, there is not just one way to do it. Earlier, you saw the aide putting on the moist towel starting at the feet. Here he did it side to side. You can adapt it for what's comfortable for you and the resident. Once you're familiar with the technique of the towel bath and you have the supplies handy, this method is as quick or quicker than a tub bath or a shower. People often ask, does no rinse soap really get people clean? And they wonder if we have to give a real bath, at least sometimes. Actually, no red soap works in a different way than regular soap. Once diluted, no additional water is needed. It dissolves dirt so it can be wiped off. Our research shows that no red soap gets people just as clean as traditional soap and water, and it's easier on the skin. We've used no red soap exclusively for as long as three years without any other type of bathing, and people have continued to smell good and their skin has remained healthy. Here are some examples of no-rinse products. 
These pre-moistened towels can be heated in the microwave. Use a different towel for each part of the body. Here are two examples of other no-rinse products. One has an oil base, the other is foamy. And here we have a shampoo in the cap. You microwave it, put it on the person's head, and massage. No rinsing. washing poses a special challenge. Let's look at a couple of clips. Flop I'm going to put on your head. Oh, don't put that up there. Get it off. Okay, I'll hurry, buddy. You're doing okay. I'll hurry. I didn't intend for you to do that. I know I don't like it. I know you don't. <laughs> Washing is done very carefully, as in this next clip, it can be frightening. Maddie, the very last thing I have to do is rinse the soap out of your hair. I'm oh. going to hold the washcloth up there. Oh. Okay. Wow, it's hot. Oh. 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 Okay, Maddie. Oh, don't do rinse it. it a little bit more. Oh. Oh, don't do it. Don't do it. It's cold. is hard. After all, the nursing assistant in the last clip was doing a lot to make the person more comfortable. She did the hair last, so the head would not be cold for the rest of the shower. She partially covered the person for warmth. She used a washcloth to soften the shower spray, and she deflected the water from the woman's face. These strategies are often enough to make hair washing go well, but they weren't enough for this person. Watch how this CNA made the situation better. We got this side just about all done, Mom. decided to separate hair washing from the shower. She knows this resident is easily overwhelmed by care routines because of her pain, sensitivity to cold, fatigue, and dementia. So she washes her hair in the beauty parlor. The resident is fully dressed and warm. The CNA uses a plastic bag and a towel around her neck to keep her clothes dry. Using washcloths in a basin of water, she washes and rinses the person's hair being careful to keep water out of her eyes and ears. Another option is to wash the hair while the person is lying flat in bed using an inflatable basin. Or you can simply create a basin in the bed by using a plastic bag and some towels. If the person truly dislikes getting their hair washed no matter what you try, think about doing it only as often as is necessary. Thus, hair washing, just like the rest of bathing, needs to be adjusted to the person's needs and wishes. And what would happen if you make these bathing changes? Well, first, you could expect to see a real decrease in resident complaints, resistance, and defensive behaviors such as hitting, grabbing, and biting. Here is Beth again, describing how things changed for her and the residents that she cares for. And when you have to continually do, do something to someone that they find unpleasant and often frightening and terrifying, then you have to kind of harden your heart. And since we've, been unable, since we've been able to individualize bathing care plans, um, you can really allow yourself to really care more for the residents in, in every aspect. The work environment is a lot more pleasant place to work now. Um, there's a lot more laughter. The residents are more relaxed um, because they're
they're not feeling intimidated and threatened by the staff. And so they're a lot more relaxed and we have, um, it's really given us a, a wider focus of truly individualizing care in every aspect of their life. Um, we have some residents who are up all night. So that's when their hygiene is provided and that's when their meals are given. This facility found it safe, practical, and better to move away from the rigid two showers a week, if you like it or not, routine, to create personalized and pleasant experiences for their residents and the staff. Can be helpful, as we saw, you know, looking at how to adapt and what's good enough and meet the need. Um, I had somebody once who had a husband that she was caring for who was much larger than she was and he was diabetic so she had to make sure she kept his feet clean she had to wash his feet a um, certain amount of times a day but he would kick her and really injure her while she was doing that and she realized that she didn't have to do both feet at the same time she ended up doing one foot one day one the next day one the next day and they both got as clean as they needed to be, as often as they needed to be washed, and she never had to wash more than one at a time, and he never had to endure more than one at a time, and it ended up working out. People also do that with full body bathing. You can bathe the top half of the body one day and the bottom half of the body the next day. You can do body one day, hair another day, hair in a facility, I mean, in a, in a, um, hair salon rather than shampooing in the shower um, or the no rinse supplies are very very helpful yes you have a question so you can find the no rinse you can just google them and you can find them online most drug stores have them so if you ask the you know go to the pharmacy section in most drug stores you can ask if they have no rinse bathing supplies and most do yes uh, so again, being flexible with the idea of clean enough, uh, you know, I, and it's, it's heartening to hear that the research shows that the no rinse supplies keep people clean enough and they actually um, keep skin intact. Another thing is kind of making the room where the cleaning is going to happen more inviting and familiar and safe. We talked about familiarity and predictability. So sometimes people get their sponge baths or their towel baths or um, in their bedrooms. Sometimes people, um, I heard someone today say, we heat up the bathroom first. Somebody here said that, you know, we make sure that it's uh, more inviting. I actually had somebody, oh, this was probably about 15 years ago. Um, I was a social worker for Redwood Caregiver Resource Center at that time, and we used to do home visits. And she had me come out to her home because she was caring for her mother who had dementia. Her mother was terrified of the bathroom. So anytime they even said, do you need to use the bathroom, her mother would run the other way. In fact, she one time ran out of the house and down the street. And so she had me come out to just kind of get a sense of her mom. Well, come to find out her mother was a pretty accomplished painter and they had mom's paintings all around the house. And I spent a long time joining with the mom just talking about her paintings. And I asked her about her paintings and she could tell me a lot about them. So working with the daughter to figure out a way to get the bathroom more accommodating, the daughter ended up putting mom's paintings down the hallway leading to the bathroom. She put a bunch of mom's paintings on the wall in the bathroom. She covered up the mirror. She got a, an area rug with no skid on the bottom that she would roll out onto the bathroom floor. She got a portable heater that she would turn on in the bathroom. And so she would have the whole room set up before she even brought mom in. She would draw the bath so mom didn't have to hear the noise of the water running. And she wouldn't say it's time for your shower or time to go to the bathroom. She would just start talking about the paintings. Oh, mom, that's the barn you, you painted when we lived in Santa Cruz. Remember such and such and such and such? One step closer to the bathroom. And this is that painting of Rufus, our dog. I love how his, he, you know, da, 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 all the things about the painting. She had to budget the time to do that, but it actually took less time than tug of war in and out of the bathroom. 
Then they would get to the bathroom, and she said, I spent about two or three minutes talking about the paintings in the bathroom, so mom had the experience of feeling safe in the bathroom. And then I would say, oh, look, mom, someone drew a lovely bath. And she would be able to more easily get mom to get into the bath. Or you know, they had the kind of relationship, if she was toileting mom, she would say, oh, since we're in here, you know what, I have to go. And she would go first and then have mom go. So not everyone's comfortable with that. That's not always possible or practical, but it worked for mom. So again, kind of thinking outside the box and keeping these things that we charted together in mind while we're trying to figure out what might make the situation a little, I hate to say more pleasant, but a little less distressing. The next film we're going to watch kind of takes these same concepts and applies them to challenges with oral care. It will probably go up to the end of our time. I have handouts up here if you would like to grab some handouts. This one on personal care kind of follows the process we did together, looking at certain causes, physical causes, emotional causes, um, for difficulty in various areas of personal care, eating, toileting, dressing, bathing, dental care. Um, so please grab the handouts afterwards if you're interested. And there is a sign-in sheet going around. I know some people came in a little late, so if you didn't have a, a chance to sign in, please do that. without a battle. In module the teeth and using the interdental brush to clean between the teeth. Now that we've gone through the stages of dementia and a few basic principles of mouth care and dementia, we're ready to talk about how to address common behavioral challenges by which people with dementia are communicating to us. That means, as you might guess, beginning at the beginning, before you walk into the room. Remember, you're focusing on the relationship, which means it's all about connecting with the person and doing so with respect. Knock before you enter the room. Approach from the front so she knows you're there. Say hello and remind her who you are. Move and speak slowly since it may take time for her to process what's happening and what you're saying. Make eye contact so she knows you're talking to her. Perhaps make small talk, such as by commenting if she looks especially nice that day. Then, Explain why you're there and ask permission to get started. If you do these things to make a connection, you'll find it easier to do something as personal as mouth care. Watch this next video. Good morning, ladies. Hello, my name is Wanda. And I'm here to clean your dinner for you this morning, okay? Is that okay with you? All right. Did you see how Wanda knocked? moved slowly toward the woman, made eye contact, then said hello, introduced herself, and asked permission to get started? These are simple, respectful activities, and they're central to good care. Challenges can and do arise, however. As we look at specific cases, we'll ask you to think about how you might handle each situation. Keep in mind that there are often as many right answers, not just one. That's why we'll focus more on problem solving rather than on finding one right solution. Here's the first situation, refusing care. It may happen right as you begin when you tell the person that it's time to clean their teeth and they say no, or shake their head, or refuse through other behaviors. What you do depends on the reason the person is refusing. We don't want to force mouth care on someone, but we do want to provide good care. So try to figure out the reason the person is refusing. Let's look at a video of one such situation and think about what the person is expressing and what you might do next. I'm here to do your mouth care. Can I go ahead and put the medicine on your teeth? It's going to make you feel better so you can enjoy your breakfast. You're 
can express her needs and probably has middle stage dementia. She's upset and tells the aide that she wants to eat first. She even tells the care provider to shut up. The aide does well in staying calm and complimenting her on the good report she got from the dentist the week before. When it becomes clear that she won't be able to do mouth care at this particular time, the aide tells the woman that she'll be back later. This is a perfectly appropriate solution. Often, a person just needs time to be in a more receptive mood. For the woman in the video we just saw, there may be a specific time that works best. Some people like mouth care as part of getting up in the morning, or as part of getting ready for bed, or both. Some prefer care before eating, and some like it afterwards. The most important thing is for you to adjust your schedule to accommodate the needs and preferences of the people you care for. Here's what one care aide had to say about her experience finding the best times to provide care. I come in around quarter of six to the Alzheimer's unit and I start in a four bedroom dorm and I get all the toothbrush, toothbrush ready and I put a towel over them and say, you can stay in bed nice and warm. I'm just gonna brush gently and I can brush and they're still snoring. I can brush and floss because the mouths are kind of already opened. Mm -hmm. So it's the best time to get them. Now let's look at another person who's refusing care. As you watch the clip, think about why she might be refusing care. Then think about what this person needs and what you would do. I'm sorry, honey. Uh -huh. Well, I got something that's gonna make you feel a little bit better. We're gonna brush them teeth, all right? And you can help me if you want to, all right? I'm gonna get set up here, all right? You'll get one. I'm gonna get set up. I'm gonna set up your toothbrush and stuff. This woman was hard of hearing and didn't actually have dementia. The real issue was that she didn't understand that the aide wanted her to brush her teeth. So for her, the solution was to speak clearly and show her the toothbrush while explaining the intent. Cure became simple once the care providers figured out what needed to be done, but until then, her mouth cure had been a challenge. Of course, Sometimes people can hear you quite well, but don't understand. In that case, you should position yourself at eye level and speak slowly and clearly. You might try explaining the situation using different words, such as saying clean instead of brush, and using gestures to help the person understand, such as modeling that you're opening your mouth and brushing your own teeth. Another reason people with dementia might refuse care is fear fear that they won't be in control of what's happening in their mouth, or fear that what you're doing might hurt. When this happens, it could help to give a reason for providing mouth care. You might say something like, your mouth will feel better, or let me get that food out from between your teeth so you're more comfortable. It's also helpful to provide reassurance by saying something like, I'll be very careful not to hurt you, or if anything bothers you, tell me right away and I'll stop. If the person has advanced dementia, you might provide something comforting to hold, such as a blanket or stuffed animal. Here's an example of a care provider making someone with mid-stage dementia feel comfortable before getting started. Pay attention to how patient the nurse aide is. This is important because like many people with mid-stage dementia,
the woman's dementia causes her to take a very long time to understand, process, and respond to what she hears. Uh, Sam, get the meat off your teeth, okay? I'm gonna give you the toothbrush and let you start brushing it so you can get that food out your teeth. You got something between your teeth. Oh, you wait till Richard comes to visit Sam. Yeah, he gonna come. He's on his way. You finished with the cup? Mm -hmm. Are you finished spitting the stuff out? All right. Yeah, brush some of that stuff out your teeth. When we do it, you gonna do it. <laughs> You want me to do it or you want to do it? You want to do it or you want me to do it? Yeah, or you want me to do it? Okay, okay. I'll let you get some of that stuff out your mouth. Another reason people refuse mouth care is simply because of bad timing. Perhaps the person is tired. You might have patience for this if you think about the mornings when you're not ready to get up. Would you want someone putting a toothbrush in your mouth? If you suspect that's the reason someone is refusing, come back later. The bottom line is that by taking the time to consider why someone is refusing, you can make mouth care a pleasant experience for both yourself and the person you're helping. You should realize that refusals are going to be more likely at first, mostly because people may not be used to having mouth care done, either at all, or by you, or in the way you're doing it. It may even hurt at first, as shown on this video. You okay, sweetie? You jumping. You okay? It hurts. It hurts? Okay, I'm gonna go easy, okay? I'm sorry. If so, you may want to not provide cure every day in the beginning, but you will want to do it regularly. In a short time, you'll be able to do it daily, not only because it's important for health, but also because getting into a routine makes mouth care more comfortable and easy to do on a regular basis. One way to phase in mouth care is to brush just the front of the teeth one day and the back of the teeth the next. Then, once the person has become comfortable with brushing, you can start to use the interdental brush between the teeth since that's often the most difficult task. If the person is agreeable and cooperative at first, but becomes upset once you start providing care, do what you can, but don't use force. For example, if you can get the toothbrush into the mouth, brush the front of the teeth. If the person opens their mouth wider, brush the back of the teeth right away, since the back is harder to reach. Rest assured that if you keep providing mouth care every day with a personalized approach, the people you care for will begin to trust both you and the process of mouth care. And after a few days or weeks, it'll become routine. The most important part of was getting the residents to get to trust me is doing the mouth care. One particular resident was, um, at first, she went from a no to a maybe, then to a yes, and then she learned to do it at home. Another type of refusal is when the person won't sit down. Again, think about why this is happening. If they're in the middle stage of dementia, they may not understand what you're asking. If the person is agitated or anxious, you may want to come back when they're more calm and already sitting. On the other hand, there are some strategies to encourage a person with dementia to take a seat. Try putting a chair right behind their legs, saying, please sit down. At the same time, pull a chair up for yourself and sit down, demonstrating the behavior. If the person continues to walk around or stand, you can still provide care. First, get the person's attention. Face them, look them in the eye, say their name, and talk with them. Once you've made a connection, you may be able to provide care standing up. There's nothing wrong with that. After all, most of us brush our own teeth standing up. You may even want to provide care in front of a bathroom sink and mirror, again, modeling a behavior that may be familiar from the past. Another common challenge is people who don't object when you ask if you can do mouth care, but who won't actually open their mouth. When this happens, it's sometimes because they don't understand you. At other times, it's because they really don't want you to brush their teeth. We'll talk about what to do in both of these situations, beginning with those who don't seem to understand what you want them to do. Let's start by looking at a video of one such person. 
Normal kan? A Good Thank you Let's look at another example Go here, open Go here, open Open it for me Okay, I'm gonna help you, okay? Alright Thank you Just relax Don't tense up Just relax, please did you notice how the aide touched the mouth with a toothbrush? She did that because touching the cheek, mouth, or lower jaw will sometimes suggest to the person that they open their mouth. This behavior could also be brought on by something familiar coming toward the mouth, such as a spoonful of food, or in this case, a toothbrush. At other times, it takes touching the mouth or lower jaw to help get the mouth to open. When the man still wouldn't open his mouth, the aide tried sliding the brush in, because once brushing begins, the person may let you continue. This type of strategy is often necessary in the late stage of dementia. Another activity some care providers find helpful is to invite the person to sing a song, which obviously gets them to open their mouth. As the person sings, you can sing along with them, making the experience even more enjoyable. Watch this. So you now have several options for encouraging people who didn't understand your request to open their mouth. Touch the mouth or lower jaw, slowly approach the mouth with a toothbrush, gently slide the brush in, or sing. You can even try all four. At other times, this situation may be different and the person may have understood your request but won't open their mouth because they really don't want their teeth brushed. Treat this the same way you would approach someone who told you they didn't want mouth care. Be patient engage in small talk, and provide a reason for mouth care, such as, let me get the food out from between your teeth so you're more comfortable. You can also ask if they want to do it themselves to promote independence and control. If all else fails, tell them you'll come back later and leave with a smile. So, as you've seen, it can take some effort to encourage someone to open their mouth, but if you keep trying different approaches, something will almost always work. The good news is that once the mouth is open, the person often keeps it open, and you can complete their mouth care. Not always, however. Some people open their mouth at first, then close it after you begin. This is why you should always keep your fingers on the outside of the teeth. If the person has closed their mouth on the toothbrush, have a rubber handle toothbrush ready, and use it to prop their mouth open, like this. Doing this will provide you with access to the inside teeth, and often as you work, they may open their mouth again. Just be careful not to hurt the person or to let yourself get hurt. <clears throat> Finally, even if the person won't open their mouth, all is not lost because you may still be able to brush the outside of the teeth. Do this by gently holding open the lips with your fingers. Another challenge is when the person grabs you or the toothbrush. This behavior is most common in the middle stage of dementia. When this happens, the first thing to do is to stop what you're doing and try to figure out why the person is grabbing. As we've said, the person may not understand what's happening, so you should first try to be sure that they do understand. Another common reason for grabbing is pain. This is usually easy to determine, like in this video. Open the mouth. Let me see again, buddy. <clears throat> I know. If you see bleeding gums or sore spots in the mouth, be gentle in those areas, talk the person through the care process, and provide care as gently as you can. If you need to, slow down and stop if necessary, but please don't give up. With regular brushing, the gums really will get healthier and stop bleeding and hurting, and you may avoid a major infection in the future. If grabbing the brush is the way a person is saying that they want to do it themselves, hand them the brush and invite them to brush their teeth. Once the person starts brushing, you can use a hand-over-hand -hand technique to provide guidance. This means placing your hand over the person's hand and helping them move the brush in the jiggle-sweep motion. Here's an example. Open your hand up. Brush your teeth. Brush your teeth. You know how to do it. Uh -uh. Go back in. Go back in and do it the right way. Go ahead. Okay.
Another reason for grabbing is if the person is anxious or scared. If you think that might be happening, provide reassurance and ask the person if she'd like to hold your hand. Right, Miss Maggie. Oh, Mom. Let me see. Oh, Mom. Oh, Mom. You can hold my hand. Oh, Mom. Mm -hmm. Hey, yeah. Get the inside of your mouth, okay? Hey, yeah. Let me see. Yeah, see? You okay? If the woman had continued to grab, the caregiver could have tried to redirect her, getting her to focus her attention on something else. Ways to do that include talking, singing, or playing music, or providing a favorite drink. Pausing mouth care to gently touch or massage someone's neck or shoulders can also work. Keep in mind that there is no one right answer when grabbing or any other behavior occurs. Every person is different, so what one person is expressing might not be what another is expressing and what works for one person might not work for another. This is why knowing the person and having a relationship with them is so important. Sometimes a person will stop grabbing if you give them something to hold or touch. Here we tried a cup. Thank you. We also tried a teddy bear. You might have other ideas about familiar objects that the person may want to hold based on what you know about her. You can also try playing music that the person likes, which may calm them. <coughs> or you could try gentle touch. Try rubbing their shoulders or arm and speaking softly to calm them. The bottom line is, if someone grabs you when you're providing mouth care, figure out why that's happening and what might help them feel more comfortable. Worse than grabbing, there may be instances when people become so upset that they try to hit you. You don't want to force care or put yourself in danger. So as soon as you see signs of someone being upset, stop and try to figure out what's going on. If you stop and change your approach at the earliest sign of agitation, most people won't get to the point of actually hitting. Still, in the middle stage of dementia, some people are unpredictable and hitting may come as a surprise. If someone does try to hit you, redirecting will often work. If you don't feel in danger, Try one of the techniques we described in the last section. But if the attempts to hit continue, stop what you're doing and come back later. Next, let's talk about people who have trouble spitting or swallowing. We see this in late stage dementia and in some persons who've had strokes. It happens when brain damage affects the ability to coordinate the mouth and throat muscles. Trouble swallowing and spitting is why we recommend using a small amount of antimicrobial rinse, water, or other liquid instead of toothpaste. That way, there's very little to spit or swallow, and these liquids are much safer than toothpaste if a little goes down the wrong way. Still, just brushing the teeth can lead to some extra saliva in the mouth, and you may want to help the person get it out. Sometimes, having the person tilt forward and putting a cup under their mouth is all you need to do to suggest that they spit. The one thing not to do is to encourage someone to swish their mouth out with water if they're unable to safely spit or swallow, because all that will do is increase the amount of liquid in the mouth. General techniques to remember for people who have trouble spitting or swallowing and to minimize aspiration, meaning inhaling the liquid, is to use the least amount of product necessary and provide care sitting up. Another technique is to use a gauze pad to dab excess liquid out of the mouth. Here's a different type of spitting problem. As you watch the video, think about what's happening and why. At first, we thought this man was being uncooperative, but when we stepped back and thought about it, we realized that he associated a cup with drinking, not spitting. He didn't understand our directions. What he knew was that a cup was in front of him, but he needed to spit, not drink. He actually responded in a very reasonable way. The solution was to provide mouth care near a sink because he associated a sink with spitting. With time and patience, you'll have similar success figuring out what works for each person. Another common behavior, particularly in middle and late dementia, is biting the brush or your finger if it's in the person's mouth. For people with dementia, biting down on what's in the mouth is probably a reflex, not something done on purpose. When something's in their mouth, they start to chew. So it's natural that they respond to the toothbrush or your finger as though it's food. 
Therefore, always be careful if you need to put any part of your hand in someone's mouth. Keep your fingers against the inside of the cheek so you can't be bitten. You also don't want the person to bite down on a cotton swab. This could be dangerous if the swab breaks because it might be swallowed. It also could be dangerous for you as you try to retrieve the swab. If the person bites the toothbrush or swab, there are several ways to get them to let go. First, try gently wiggling the brush or swab and ask the person to open her mouth. If that doesn't work, have a smaller brush ready and use it to work around the brush that's being bitten. Sometimes this will cause the person to open her mouth. If the person still clamps down on the brush, try gently rubbing the cheek, massaging in front of the ear where the jaw joint is. How you doing, Abby? This often causes the person to relax the jaw muscle. If you feel safe, you can also slide your finger along the inside of the cheek and massage the jaw more directly. A similar behavior you may encounter is the person sucking on the toothbrush. This may happen because the sensation of sucking is pleasant. More commonly, it's because in late dementia, sucking is an instinctive reflex. Whatever the cause, you can use the same strategies to remove the toothbrush as you use for biting. More common than sucking on the toothbrush is having your fingers sucked on when you're cleaning the gums, cheek, and tongue with gauze. If this happens, stop and think why it's happening. Is it because they think it's food? Because it's painful or bothering them? Or is it just a reflex? Here are some suggestions to address sucking. If the person thinks it's food, explain in simple terms what's in their mouth and what you're doing. If it's painful or uncomfortable, be gentle, recognize the pain, and assure them you'll finish quickly. If it's a reflex, back off and start again. You may also want to redirect the person using the strategies we presented earlier. We've now discussed all of the primary behavioral challenges that may accompany mouth care provided to persons with dementia. The key is to understand that these challenges are actually a form of communication. So as we talked about before, all behavior is a form of communication. It's the attempt to fill an unmet need. So the strategy here is to be a detective. I'm going to turn that off so it's not shining on me. To be a detective and try to figure out what need the behavior is trying to fill. I, I think they mentioned three or four times, don't force it, don't force it, don't force it. And at the same time, don't give up. You may not be able to get it to work today, but tomorrow might be the day, and if not tomorrow, maybe Friday. So, you know, continually trying, continuing to be um, adaptive, something is always better than nothing, um, and, and give yourself permission to do a good enough job. I think part of where the anxiety and frustration comes up for a lot of family caregivers that I work with is that sense of responsibility. You know, the, the doctor, the rest of the family, all these people expect me to maintain someone's care at this level and it's really not realistic or possible. It's becoming unsafe, it's becoming scary, it's becoming uncomfortable. So how can we meet needs in a way that's good enough that doesn't cause us to feel so threatened or cause our loved one for whom we're providing care to feel threatened? I, I think the, the singing sounds so silly, but I can't tell you how many people I've gotten to use the toilet or to go to, you know, any, any kind of task, walk to go have lunch or walk to the car to go to an appointment by singing with them. And if you think about the basic needs that we talked about, who do we sing with? We usually sing with people who are familiar to us. So, you know, especially if you sing a favorite song. You know, I knew the people that I worked with, there was one person I would always sing, I left my heart in San Francisco. I wouldn't say, do you need to use the ladies room right now? I would just walk up and say, I left my heart in San Francisco. And we'd get up and start dancing and we'd dance to the bathroom. <laughs> or, you are my sunshine, or, 
um, you know, whatever song for them conjured up familiar, comfortable memories. Memories evoke emotion, and if we can connect someone to a memory of a time where they felt safe and secure and things felt familiar and they felt like they had a sense of personal power and control and value and worth, then in the moment we can help them feel safe in the tasks that we're, that we're performing with them. Just like that daughter who so beautifully made the hallway and the bathroom her mother's art gallery. Very familiar, lovely, comforting memories. So mom felt safe in that environment. We have just about two minutes left. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody have any comments? Um, I know this was a lot. Yes. So I'd like to say a word about the hair washing. Uh -huh. You mentioned going to a salon. Uh -huh. I found a salon in Robert Park where we live where for five dollars she'll wash her hair and put her under the, the, the hair dryer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and we go to McDonald's for a two dollar frosty afterwards and it's an outing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's lovely. So, so it's a spa day. It's a standing yeah. two minute appointment to get her hair washed. Great. And I don't have to do it. Yes, thank you for sharing so that. Ask around. You might find something mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that. Here. And it becomes something special mm -hmm. rather than something threatening. Um, absolutely. So, And sometimes the way we talk about what we're doing, those towel baths can be massages. You know, let me rub your back. And you can even just do that with a warm washcloth and a basin in someone's bedroom. You know, let me rub your back for you. Here I have some lovely, a lovely warm cloth. Um, so the way we market it has a lot to do with somebody's response. And again, the, the, you know, if we think about that, the second class on communication strategies, that our thoughts, attitudes, and actions significantly impact on the behavior of the person with dementia. So if we're frazzled and it's been a long day and we're trepidatious because we know last time they had a hard time and we're feeling anxious ourselves, and we're kind of trying to get it over with, they're going to pick up on that instinctively and intuitively, and they're going to take their cue from us that something must be wrong, and then they're going to get their guard up. So, you know, they talked a lot about the, the person receiving care's timing, but also think about your own timing. What time of the day or week are you more likely to have some emotional reserves, some energy, some ability to remember all the stuff you already know, but have, a, have trouble conjuring up in the moment because it's so exhausting. Um, so give yourself permission to be flexible with your own timing. Bottom line, be flexible. Good enough is often better than perfect because good enough is sustainable. If you have questions, things come up, you want help with problem solving, please don't hesitate to call our department here at Kaiser if your loved one is a Kaiser patient and or also call Redwood Caregiver Resource Center and talk with one of their family consultants. The videos we watched today are actually from their lending library. I just, I, we watched the whole bathing without a battle. We watched just a clip of the mouth care without a battle. So if you want to check these out from them, you can. They usually let people keep them for about a week or two. Um, please feel free to come up and get some handouts. 10 real life strategies for dementia caregiving, caregiver's guide to understanding dementia behavior, and then this is the one on personal care that kind of brainstorms possible reasons for challenges in, in different areas of personal care. Thank you everyone for being here today. I hope it was helpful. Take care. <laughs>